evening. It's Tuesday night, 8 o'clock, and this is the Bob Leonard Show. And for those who are tuning in for the first time, we take the stories you've been reading about in your newspaper and watching on television this week, and we, we tell you what's really behind those stories. And, you know, we put our spin on it. We interpret it for you. And like we tell you every week, it's only our opinion. You can accept or reject it. Now, this program will be repeated tomorrow night, Wednesday night, from 11 till 12. And then it's seen continuously on the Internet on flinttalk.com. So you can tune in there on your computer anytime you want, and the show will be there. So if you miss it, you can see it in those places. Uh, last week we had a little technical problem, and we didn't get our show on, and we had a repeat the show we did two weeks ago, so we apologize for that, and uh, we'll try to make up for it this week. Uh, we have a number of things we want to discuss, so some of them will be quick and some of them a little more detailed. But, you know, tonight we have uh, some information that concerns a case we first talked to you about on this program about five or six weeks ago. At that, at that time, we were somewhat critical at the lack of progress in the investigation into a robbery at gunpoint, the sexual assault, and the abduction of an African-American mother and her daughter from a gas station on the corner of Welsh and Chevrolet Avenue in Flint. We suggested to you at that time, because there was no movement on the case, that it may not have been given that high priority because of the color of the victims. Now, here, here's the TV, first TV report on this, the day after it happened. Can you play that, please? 10-year-old daughter who claimed they were carjacked at gunpoint yesterday morning and dropped off in the middle of a west side neighborhood in Flint. Tanya Clausell says this all started when she and her daughter stopped at the Marathon gas station at the corner of Chevrolet and Welch on their way to school yesterday morning. Tanya says a man asked her for money, then when she said she didn't have it, he pulled out a gun and carjacked them. She says he rifled through her purse and tried to fondle both of them. Tanya then told him to take the car and she and her daughter managed to escape. Oh, you just have me in fear. You know, I'm just, I don't feel safe here. Police are looking for the man and Tanya's 2004 four-door Chevrolet Cavalier, which has a dent on the driver's side rear bumper. If you have any information, you are urged to call Flint Police. The you know, after that report, nothing Nothing. Now, this, this was a serious crime. This was a crime of hijacking, of armed robbery, of sexual assault, of kidnapping. Three of those crimes are life sentences. Right in daylight. From a busy intersection. And we get to one report. There's no follow-up. We never found out what happened to the car. We wondered, what's going on here? And we said then, that if this, were ha this happened over on Miller Road, and a black hoodlum jumped into somebody's car with their daughter, and did the things they did to this woman, it'd be on the, pay on the newspaper's front page every day on the progress. Television stations would be covering it on what's happening on this case, but not with this case. One day, it dies. But anyway, what we did is we sat, and we mentioned this every week for about five or six weeks since it happened, that there was no progress. So I went to the chief of police, Gary Hagler, and asked him about the progress of the investigation. At that time, he, he seemed to be really kind of unfamiliar with the case, but he did promise me he'd check it out. Now, interestingly, after I talked to him the following day, 
the Flynn police contacted the newspaper and the TV stations and distributed to them a composite likeness of the su a suspect. As we said before, why did it take so long? I'm sure the victims were the ones that provided the information on the su suspect. They could have got that the day after, put it in the next day's paper. But it took five weeks. All four TV stations and the journal carried the story and the composite of the suspect. Play that next tape, will you please? to sexually assault a woman and her teenage daughter early last month. Take a look at this. Police say this is a composite of the suspect, a man about 5 feet 7 inches tall, 150 pounds, with a medium to dark complexion. He's between 16 and 18 years of age with a thin mustache and goatee. Police believe his first name may be Deontay, goes by the nickname of D. If you have any information, call Flynn Police. An update now for ABC 12. This is for the, her 13-year-old daughter who claimed they were carjacked at gunpoint yesterday morning and dropped off in the middle of a west side neighborhood in Flint. Tanya Clausell says this all started when she and her daughter stopped at the Marathon gas station at the corner of Chevrolet and Welch on their way to school yesterday morning. Tanya says a man asked her for money, then when she said she didn't have it, he pulled out a gun and carjacked them. She says he rifled through her purse and tried to fondle both of them. Tanya then told him to take the car and she and her daughter managed to escape. Oh, you just have me in fear, you know, I'm just, I don't feel safe here. Police are looking for the man and Tanya's 2004 four-door Chevrolet Cavalier, which has a dent on the driver's side rear bumper. If you have any information, you are urged to call Flint Police. The yeah, it's pretty wild. Uh, you know, this is in the Wild West. This is Flint, Michigan. We're supposed to be a civilized society. We're supposed to have laws. We're supposed to react when these things happen. Now, after my meeting with Hagler, I'm told Hagler, to his credit, or the investigation be given top priority. The result of the order has caused a suspect to be arrested this past weekend. And he's been identified as the offender. And he's been charged with kidnapping, a life term. Two kidnapping charges, is the, the, the daughter and the, and the mother. Carjacking, felony weapon. There's three life uh, terms that can be charged here. And you have to wonder, is it a coincidence that the day after we talked to Hagler, something was done with this case? Now our suggestion, and we certainly suggested, that racism possibly played a role in, the, in establishing, or, the la or not establishing, a sense of urgency in solving this case. Now it, it doesn't necessarily mean that there was personal ra racism on the part of the police officers or the chief. But this is what we call institutional racism of a police department and even the news media that covered this story. Why didn't they come in and say, what's going on with this case? Follow up on this case. You know, this type of racism is an imperfection embedded in our society's institutions, such as the police department and the news outlets. This has been true since our country was founded. And it has kind of just sat there, fermented, just constantly, just nobody did anything about it. As a result, it becomes a virus that, um, you know, unless you're confronted by well-meaning men and women, in charge of these organizations, it will fester and continue to adversely impact our society. This is, this is what you call a built-in institutional racism. It's still embedded in our police department and our, and our news outlets. And this, this is true consciously 
or unconsciously. People may not recognize it, may, or they may recognize it and can care less a uh, little about what happens. You know, the racism is that minority victims of crime do not have to receive the same consideration in dealing with this problem as being victims as white victims. I mean, I mean like I said, this case of a mother and a daughter being robbed, assaulted, and abducted in their own car at gunpoint is really a case of point. This case received short shift by the police department and the news media after the first day. It fell off the radar screen. Now, you know, ask yourself honestly. Do you really believe such a case would have received this lack of concern by the police department and the press if, as I mentioned to you, this hoodlum, black hoodlum had jumped in a car with white people, a daughter and a, and a mother, and abducted them, sexually assaulted them? Do you really believe we would have heard no more about this after the first day, like this case with this African-American mother and daughter? Yeah, so you don't misunderstand them. I'm not suggesting that such assaults on white folks be demoted to the same attention as the black victims. No, I'm really, I'm really suggesting that black victims be given the same sense of urgency to solving the crimes committed against them as the police department and the press now give crimes of this nature committed against white folks. And you know, like I say, this could be, this racism is conscious or unconscious in some cases. It's called institutional racism. It's been with us for a hundred years. When it started, there was personal racism. And that slowly has eroded, that slowly has been eliminated. But the institution, the police department, the, the insurance company, whatever it is that discriminates, it's built into the system. Decisions are made based on what happened 100 years ago, 50 years ago, 25 years ago, when these decisions were made because people were personally discriminating against minorities. How do you get rid of that? You know, to his credit, I believe Chief Hagler began the cleansing of this disease of racism from his department the same day I spoke with him. Not because I mentioned it to him, because I never mentioned the term institutional racism, but because he recognized the disease and began to deal with it. I think he said, if he honestly t uh, was being truthful with me, Hey, I haven't heard about this case, although it was in the paper, but I don't remember it. He immediately assigns some of his best men to the case. And the guy who was in charge of it, uh, Detective Tony Pittman, is an outstanding homicide investigator. And he and his people were directed to give this case top priority. Why did it all of a sudden be in the paper the following day after I talked to him? And, that, and here's what happened. Within a week and a half, we have the culprit because they did what police department should do, took it seriously, and didn't pay attention to the color of the victims. That's the way it should always work. And like I say, you know, the department does deserve credit for quickly understanding and appreciating what was going on here. You know, and it's not just our police department. Every police department in the country is like this. It started 50, 100 years ago. Well, black people didn't have any power. They saw what was going on 100 years ago, 50 years ago, 25 years ago. What's going on today? 
But today they have a little power. And they can demand greater attention to their problems in situations like this. And the tragedy, and thank God it, apparently it didn't happen, is that this, if this case was followed up in the same fashion it was after I spoke to Hagler, this guy might have been off the streets five weeks ago. And he, we wouldn't be exposing our citizens to this hoodlum's attack on them. I don't know if he did attack anybody else. We haven't heard. I don't know if there was another case like this, but you know, it seems to me our citizens deserve better and I hope now that they will get better. Because as I say, I don't believe Hagler and the, obviously the officers are involved in this case. Some of them are African American. Uh, allow this to go on because of their personal pre uh, because of their personal prejudices. I think it's just been blacks in the past never had the same consideration as victims of crimes that other people have, like white the white community. We need to change that. Let's go on here. Um, let's talk about for a few minutes about the Flint uh, Councilwoman Carolyn Sims's uh, turning back her opponent's effort to recall her as a city council person here a couple of weeks ago. As we said in the past uh, on this program, we generally oppose recall elections unless they're for an official who is being recalled for the commission of a crime and the performance of his duties. Such efforts as recalls invariably cost the taxpayers money to hold such elections and in the most part these cases turns out to be kind of an exercise in futility. This is what happened in the Sims recall drive. You know, the voters saw through the hoax and, you know, in this recall and recognized it for what it was, a personal vendetta by her opponents who couldn't beat her in the regular election two years ago. We've argued that an elected official should be permitted to finish their full term that they've been elected for. And then the public has an opportunity to make a, an educated judgment on the job that's been done over this four years. How do you get a real feel of how well this, your elected official is doing after six months or a year, whatever the case may be, when the recall starts? You know, keep in mind that far fewer people vote in a recall than vote in the general election. You know, the recall vote uh, may not give a fair impression of what the larger part of the community thinks uh, about the job that the official is doing. You know, two, three percent may vote in the recall election, or 20, 25 percent may vote in the general election. You know, the majority of people in the, that she represented may like what she's doing, but they don't get out and vote. Some people say, well, then. Let her fall. That's not fair. That's why these recalls are, are bad. I'd rather wait till you have a much larger percent of the people coming to the polls. They have a right to vote. They have a right to express, express their opinion. They've done it once. They elected her. Leave her alone. You know, well, I don't always agree with her on some of the positions she takes as councilwoman of the city uh, on city matters. You know, she does re deserve respect for some of her decisions. She makes some tough and controversial issues. I was impressed with some of them. On the other hand, she does get carried away on occasion, causing her to make intemperate and, and kind of mean-spirited remarks. You know, the most recent example is what is that was uh, her ill-advised description of the police officers who shot and killed a woman that was allegedly brandishing a knife at them, she, she turned them as murderers. I, you know, her characterization of them, in my opinion, was unfair since the investigation of what really happened between the women and the two police officers had just begun. 
you know, to her credit, though, she did later apologize for uh, these uh, off-the-cuff remarks, and, and I, you know, I think that she meant it. But on the whole, if she j can just keep control of her impulse of anger, out angry outbursts, often on display when she's dealing with her opponents, she should be a very effective force in moving Flint forward in the years ahead. You know, in my opinion, she, sh she uh, would be much more effective with the use of political diplomacy and dealing with the issues that come before the council, even when, <laughs> when, they're, when they originate with her staunch enemy, Mayor Don Williamson. Well, we'll see what happens here. Uh, just let her alone, let her finish her term and see what happens. Then you make a decision on it. Now let's look at uh, a few of the candidates running for some of the offices in Genesee counties, especially in the two largest cities, Flint and Burton. We can't get to them all. We'll get to them as the, uh, as the uh, election goes forward in the next five, six, eight weeks. You know, what are some of the good and the bad points as, as I've been watching them for some time? And I t like I tell you, it's just my opinion. You take Don Williamson. He, his accomplishments, he feels, are he just opened the uh, city jail. And it was on television last night. I'm sure it'll be in the newspaper today, or maybe it was in yesterday, about them uh, opening the jail. That's pretty significant. It's been closed for 10 years, and they haven't had a place to put a lot of people. Yeah. He's worked hard, give him credit, to get it opened again. He's budgeted for it, and now it's open. Obviously, it will help uh, clean up the streets. Uh, people running around well, warrants, uh, with warrants for them, and, and there, nobody arresting them simply because they didn't have any way to, anywhere to put them. But they do now, so that's an important thing. And keep in mind, he's, uh, he's, his uh, budget's in the black for the first time in years and years and years, which he promised to do. I think the man does care for Flint, and he does things that people see happening out in Flint. You know, he paves the streets, he cuts the grass, he, he paints over the graffiti, he reorganized the police department. That may be one of his bad traits, but some people think it's a good trait. So it can go under both category, either category. And he's established an administration that is reflective of the city's population. That is the makeup, racial and economic. And I think that's good. And he does work at solving individuals' problems. He does listen to the little guy. Now, you know, he has some bad traits. You know, he, he picks political fights unnecessarily, which in my opinion slows the progress of making the city better. You don't need that. You know, he, he does show off a little patience with people, even to the point of sometimes being rude or unfair, especially with some city employees. Now, some members of the public feel, uh, you know, that's what he should be doing. But I think you could do it with a little bit more restraint, a little bit more civilized. But we'll see what happens here. Now we have another fellow by the name that's on the city council running, city councilman ne uh, Sheldon Neely. Now, I've known him for a number of years. I know his dad, nice man, nice family. One of the good traits is he has no chance in winning. He's a Stanley candidate. Meets with Stanley just about every day of a meeting down there. Stanley winds him up and sends him into that council meeting. His family didn't even want him to run, but Stanley did. So Stanley, you look at him, what he does in council meetings. He's a total obstructionist. Promotes divisiveness all the time against Williamson. 
I never saw him vote for anything that Williamson has brought before the council. I mean, you can't, you know, a guy like that isn't going to help you move the city ahead. And let me tell you, I've had experience with him, and it's very difficult to trust what he says. This is a grave defect in politics. I don't think he's very smart, especially when he lets Stanley take him around by the nose. It's ridiculous. He, as I say, he's always against whatever Williamson wants. And, and you know, often there are cases where you should oppose what Williamson wants, and they can legitimately oppose it, even though maybe they're wrong. But if they do it honestly, based on their honest beliefs, you can understand that. But there are some things I think that Williamson will come up with that he does get through, but you'll find Neely probably opposed to it. And then he, he constantly makes intemperate remarks and actions towards other council people who object to his excessive confrontations. That goes on frequently down there. And as I say, as we proceed through the campaign, we'll look at some of the other candidates, too. Let's look at the, the uh, contest out in Burton, the mayor of Burton. Well, he has some good traits. He, he's an effective politician. He built a new city hall. And... Uh, so there's here crowd files in Burton. Uh, the council race, they have 18 candidates, many new in politics. And it says Smiley will seek fifth term. It says Abbey case may affect Burton mayor's image, and we'll get into that. And Smiley said he will keep the campaign positive. This guy's never kept a campaign positive in his life. He's got those middle-of-the-night flyers that go out with no signature on it, illegal flyers going out, just bad-mouthing his opponents all the time. You know, never bad mouth Smiley, so it's obviously coming from his people. But some of his real bad traits are, you know, he could, the bottom line is he created a corrupt city government burden. He's alleged to have taken bribes from Blake Rizzo, a land developer, who testified under oath, has been working with the FBI for two years on this, that he gave Smiley bribes. He admitted giving money to other people in the Smiley administration and supporters of Smiley. Here's Smiley receiving <laughs> envelopes with, with uh, filled with cash on street corners from Rizzo's secretary. Remember she testified to that in, that, in a case against Abby. And then, you know, he hires relatives and friends in, in, to sensitive city jobs where their only qualification for their job is that they were friends with Smiley. Or became a friend of him. And then now you see he's working so hard to keep Charles Abbey, his closest political ally, and Burton Public Works Director that was recently convicted of bribery. Uh, they want to keep him quiet so he won't out Smiley as to his illegal activity. So he's doing everything he can for him. The most recent thing is he wants to pay him his pension. The mayor he just was convicted. The company that uh, runs the pension plan for Burton, uh, Mich Michigan Municipal Thor uh, Employees Pension Plan, said that they would not pay the pension if they get a letter from the mayor of the city saying that he had been convicted. Smiley won't send that letter. 
I think uh, one of Smiley's opponent has a, a reasonable approach to it, Lori Tennant. She says that she would give him the pension if Abby cooper cooperates with the feds in the investigation of all the rest of corruption in city of Burton City Hall that he's aware of. So far, he apparently hasn't cooperated. Why give him a pension? Why reward him? Then we have people like Ralph Duke, one of Smiley's key people, who I actually is sitting on the council illegally right now, but nobody's raised the point. He's running for uh, election. He was appointed by the Smiley Council, the Ishams, the uh, um, Wells, and people like that on that council. And they took over the council again. Even after the city, the citizens, the voters, voted in a slate in 206 of anti-smiley people. And at that time, the council was controlled by the people that wanted to get rid of Smiley, look into what he's been doing. But as soon as the two, uh, two openings occurred there, somebody moved out of the city who was a councilman and they appointed uh, uh, one of Smiley's people who made it kind of a 3-3 three, three, when another one opened up and they appointed a fourth, another Smiley person. And now the, we're back to square one. Smiley people now run the, the uh, city council again. There's no checks and balances. Now some other people that are running, uh, a woman by the name of Tina Connolly, she's a uh, city council person, and I guess a nice person. Uh, but keep in mind, she's only been on the council for a year and a half, has had no previous political experience. By that I mean she has not been active in city government to speak of. But she is running because County Commissioner Jamie Curtis has adopted her as his protege. You see, Curtis really wants to be mayor, but he, he just, he's just been elected to County Commission. He was elected to City Council there for about two years, elected to County Commission. He keeps trying to move up, but he can't run for mayor. It would look too bad now. But he's going to try to be mayor <laughs> through a surrogate councilwoman Conley. You know, remember Curtis? He was a big Stanley or Smiley supporter. And he orchestrated the Smiley takeover of the city council this year with the appointment of his friend Jeff Majors, who was a, <laughs> a clear Smiley guy. And then Ralph LaDuke big supporters of Mayor Smiley. Now this coup d'etat, which I'm talking about, caused by Curtis, with the filling of these council vacancies with Smiley supporters, really was a repudiation of what the voters' decision was in 2006 to elect anti-Smiley council members to have a check and balance on this guy. Well, We'll see what happens there, but you should know what's behind some of these candidates. Now, you know, then we have uh, Lord Tennant who's running, and obviously uh, we have watched her over the years when she was a city council person, six years on the councilwoman. And listen, the FBI will tell you this, everybody tells you, and it, and it showed in the trial itself that she blew the lid off the Burton corruption by getting the FBI and local prosecutor to look at her evidence she has gathered over the years while she was on the council showing wrongdoing. She was able to demonstrate that Smiley and his supporters in and out of government had been ripping off the Burton taxpayers for years. Tannen represents the antithesis of another four years of the Smiley government corruption.
You know, she has really no hidden agenda. Other than trying to bring integrity and honesty back to the to Burton government. I think you have to look at her record. It really kind of speaks for itself. Well, we'll see what happens. Uh, there is a fourth candidate, and his name is uh, Johnston, and uh, he he's in the fire department. There's some question whether he is permitted to run, if he's a member of the fire department. I don't know why he couldn't run, but uh, they're looking into it. And if he's prohibited, uh, you know, he could bring a lawsuit. Whether he'll succeed or not, I don't know. It'll just cost him big attorney fees, but maybe he can afford it. Now I want to look at some, as, as much time as we have, some political tidbits as they say, as time permits. Now, the theme of, of these stories we're going to talk about is screw the taxpayer. And that's what these stories are all about. Maybe you've seen some of them, maybe you haven't. Maybe you didn't realize what was behind them. But the, fir the first one we want to talk about is... Um, the former Flint school superintendent. What legacy did he leave in Flint to the Flint School Board and the taxpayers besides lying about his education when he started out? Besides uh, hiring a pedophile to work with our children? Besides creating a legal or an ill-conceived school reorganization plan? Besides putting the district in debt for over a million dollars and overspending school budget for school books and other things. And then he leaves us with a, a credit card debt for personal benefits, including his running back and forth to Springfield while seeking out that community school superintendent job. Here's a, here's a story that was in the Flint Journal. Um, on uh, May 2nd of this, uh, this year, it says, Outgoing school superintendent Walter Middleton spent thousands of taxpayers' dollars on a district credit card an expense account. But 10 weeks after filing a Freedom of Information Act, the Flint Journal still hadn't received receipts of Melton spending. I, I understand they've received something now, but they haven't really looked into it. Now the question is, if he does show it, uh, you know, there's a lot of their money there. Uh, thousands of dollars. Two district officials Board of Education Treasurer Vera J. Perry and School Board Attorney Kendall Williams said the lack of receipts is because Milton didn't follow instructions to turn in all his receipts to the district business office. Milton said no one told him he had to do that until two weeks ago. Well, you know, that contradicts what these people are saying. Perry and Williams said they reiterated to Milton in January that he should submit his receipts to the district office. So he knew. He didn't want to show where he was spending all this money to get this other job, in my opinion. It says this, documents provided by the district uh, so far show Milton charged just under $10,000 to his credit card from October 205 to February 207. He also had $5,857 in expenses for a 206 calendar year through $600 per month stipend. He uh, not only had the credit card on uh, limited uh, use, he had this $600 every month to use for how he wanted. Milton acknowledged uh, some were related to out-of-state personal trips but noted that his contract provides for unrestricted use of a car. We're not talking about the car, we're talking about the credit card. 
And then you know, it isn't like this is unusual. In the uh, May 5th article in 2006, that's a year ago, when Milton was coming here, it says this in that article by the Flint Journal, Auditors and the Flint Superintendent let me start again. Auditors in Flint Superintendent Walter Melton Jr.'s former school district in New York have questioned whether he fully reimbursed the district for personal expenses, was overpaid by, for moving expenses, and received a, 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 the correct salary in 205, or 204, 205. Here are some of the er uh, errors apparently were made in calculating his salary. Yeah, well, you can bet they were calculated over what he was supposed to get. And then they could not find proof that he totally reimbursed the Fallsburg district for personal expenses charged on a district provided credit card. So he had some experience with these credit cards. And then another concern cited by the audit finding was uh, thousands of dollars in extra payments to Gateway Learning Incorporated for which auditors couldn't find a contract. Guess who the Gateway was? Gateway is run by Julius B. Anthony, now a consultant to Milton, Milton and Flint, and previously a consultant in Fallsburg. Oh, that's interesting. No contract, just give it to him. The district has made some changes, such as canceling district credit cards. No kidding. So we have now, now we have this interesting part. You know, here's a guy that left the district. He quit. He ran out on his contract, which we had another year or two to run. He's gone. Milton continued drawing salary as school consultant. They're paying this guy as a consultant while he's in, while he's in uh, Springfield. says here, outgoing school superintendent Waller Milton Jr. will continue collecting a paycheck as a consultant even though his uh, full-time stint heading the district will end Friday. This was, this was May 10th, so it ended a week ago. The district will pay Milton at his regular rate of pay, $156,000 per year, through June 30th under the terms of the deal he reached with the board. It amounts to about $20,000 more. He said he'll be uh, called as a consultant on an as-need basis. Now, he, here he's in Springfield and we're still paying him. He's getting paid both places, apparently. It says, under the terms of Milton's contract before the board amended it Wednesday, Milton was required to give three months written notice to terminating his contract. Failure to do so would have caused him to lose the right to any pay for a cure, uh, cure, cured time off. Yeah, I got it. Board member Raymond Hatter called the deal a win-win for both of us. Come on, how can he say that? He violated his own contract. He didn't give three months notice. And we're still paying the guy. Now keep in mind, keep in mind that we're paying this guy by the old board. In other words, the board that in effect has been voted off, the majority of them have been voted off in the, the election about two, two weeks ago. But they don't take office till July 1st. I can't imagine what would happen to that. Now, now keep in mind, he gets his pay. He's doing, you know, he's supposed to be a consultant. He's down there in Springfield. He's gone. Has his credit card debt. Nobody knows what he was using that for, other than that it spent over ten thousand dollars on it of taxpayers' money. Now, we have this article that was in May twelfth in the Flint Journal. Former superintendent still owes on Flint home. Now here's, here's, I've got the real estate thing out of the city of Flint. And he owes, according to the newspaper, 
$7,500 and the, and the debt has grown with more than $300 in penalties and about 225 interest to date. What he's done, he hasn't paid his taxes. Says his house is up for sale and is listed at $529,000. <laughs> he, he says he was going to take care of it. This was three weeks ago. That week, and according to the papers we pulled last, or this week, at the end of last week it was, he still hasn't paid the taxes. So we have the guy who runs out on his taxes, runs out on his credit card debt, and we're still paying the guy. Now where is the reasonableness of something like that? You know, you have to wonder, and it's called kind of screw the public, screw the taxpayers. And then we have this thing with the president uh, of the uh, Rob Martin raises more than ethical questions are racking up $3,055 in cell phone bill paid by the taxpayers again over a six month period. You know, you, you have to say, uh, you know, here's the Flint board president racking up over uh, 3,000 cell phone bills over a six month period. And you have to say, that's 5.5 hours a day during this time based on the billing from the cell phone company. 44,000 minutes in six months period. Uh, this uh, f uh, five point five hours may be per month, but it, it's f uh, something like forty four thousand minutes in six month period. And the records indicate many of these minutes were used on personal calls, and she admitted that. You know, it's really not sending a good message to taxpayers when they're laying off teachers and showing a budget deficit for over thirteen million dollars. You know, you have to wonder what, what people are thinking of. Now here's another ripoff. Official causes your cash. Here we have the city and the county commission, city council, county committee, setting up political slush funds with your money. $60,000, listen to this. Holiday, it says here, official causes, your cash, generosity flows from public coffers. Holiday parties benefit debtors in cash for their favorite charities. Elected officials in Flint and Genesee County are literally giving away your tax money. And their generosity adds up to more than $60,000. Every year, members of the Genesee County Board of Commissioners get $2,000 each, and the Flint City Council members receive $1,500 each in special accounts they use for charitable and often political savvy donations. In tightening uh, county budgets and municipal budgets, how can you justify that, says State Representative David Robertson of uh, Grand Blanc. Officials largely defend the accounts as ways to fulfill important needs to residents who otherwise often have nowhere else to turn. Well, then it goes on to say, uh, the Flint City Council, uh, in the Flint City Council, they've called ward accounts. And they're, they've been used to pay for flowers at a funeral, $50 or more, and help throw several Christmas parties. Now, you know, in the old days, when I was in politics, you had a political fund that you raised from contributors. And that's what you used to pay what these people are paying for now. County Commission gave a total of $825 to Burton City uh, Burton Girl planning a trip to Orlando, Florida. Well, I think it's wonderful. She was competing in the sweetheart pageant. But why should we be paying for that? 
City Councilman Scott Kincaid plopped down $800 to sponsor a table at the IMA Children's Recreation Fund. Salute to John T Cherry. You know, another Democrat taking care of another Democrat. It was a party or a dinner for him. Why should we be paying for that? Yeah, you know, I like Scott Kincaid and I like John Cherry, but we shouldn't be paying for those things. They should be paying it out of their own political slush funds. They keep those for the basketball and the football games, I guess. City Councilwoman Jackie Poplar spent $566 to throw a Christmas party in 205 giving away hot dogs, hats, and gloves. Commissioner Renata Speed, a board member of McCree Theater, spent $410 to buy season tickets to the McCree Theater, helping fund one of the things that she is part of. Come on. While taxpayers pick up the tab for the giveaways, the politicians themselves usually get credit and bask in the voting public gratitude. Most city council members specifically ask to be notified when the checks are ready so they can personally deliver them. Requests for donation often spell out what the official will get in return. That is, the official dinner with several hundred potential voters at an organization's fundraising event, advertisements and brochures distributed to, uh, to supporters, names sprayed on the back of t-shirts given to children, sometimes even the, an advertisement in the newspaper. Here, here's some other things. Woodrow Sandy, $200 for the Elm Park Neighborhood Summer Festival, which included a voter registration drive. $100 for relay for life t-shirts. Ted Hammond, who's now a state representative, 300 for priority children, 500 for Atherton High School basketball team shirts. Miles Godola, $250 uh, for Powers Catholic High School students trip to Rome. $500 to Grand Blanc High School for post-graduation celebrations. In the city council, Carrie Nelson, $317 for community youth rally, $150 for a Halloween party. Ch uh, Carolyn Sims, $200 for Christmas presents for children of a constituent who died suddenly, $750 for a consortium of child abuse and neglect. Sheldon, nearly $105 for tickets to a spring fundraiser for Salem Housing Task Force. $500 for sound video and rental fees associated with December town hall meeting. He, he, he pays for this, these town hall meetings, gets 50, 100 people there, and then talks about him running for mayor. We're, we're funding that type of thing. And other people are giving to churches that they belong to. I mean, this is crazy. This, this can be a violation of, of uh, the separation of church and state. If, if the city, the county, had directly given the money a clear violation, what's the difference? Screw the taxpayer. That's what's happening here again. Then we have the centers, senior citizen centers. Uh, we told you this when we when it started out. We told you when we opposed the senior citizen millage last spring, before it went on uh, the August ballot. This proposal was going to uh, turn out to be a ripoff of the taxpayers' money, and I'm convinced that's happening. Yeah, because it lacks specifics. Uh, we suggested uh, a reason for it, uh, you know, for these was for these senior citizen centers. They were going to build them. They were going to improve them. Uh, they were going to do whatever they could for the uh, senior citizens who are using the centers. Now, keep in mind, we told you in the primary the use of the money would be used by the ten percent of senior citizens who use the center. The other ninety percent of the senior citizens in county don't use it. What is it used for now? 
senior citizen centers in, in uh, London and um, let's see was it was London Mount Morris and Burton will have their centers improved uh, you know the brick and mortar uh, is going to be uh, paid for by your senior citizens money and then the salary enhancement community split on director's pay they want to raise her pay by something like uh, 60 percent 61 percent raise if the senior authority had been able to overcome the previous Richfield objections to the smaller raises. We told you that's what they were going to do. That's why those senior citizen people, the, the directors and the employees were pushing so hard because they knew they were going to get pay increases, or at least they thought they were. Where's the money for, for Meal on wheels, the visiting nurses, the the uh, transportation for shopping and doctors where these people can't get out. No, no mention of that. All this money going to these senior citizens. They're giving $150,000 to them. And you know, the city of Flint gets 400000 And every other center in the county generally gets, you know, 150000 The 400000 going to Flint is for four centers. We have more than that. We have more than that working with seniors. The city collects a $1,200,000 for, uh, for the millage money, and they get 400000 back? Come on. Where's the, where's the commissioner's Smiley, Renetta Speed, uh, this Curtis and these people, where are they saying, we want money for the centers uh, in the south end of Flint that Curtis represents? We want them for the north end of Flint, and Burston and, and uh, McKinley and those places, McKinley in the south end. Where are their, their actions? Where are their objections to Flint not getting more money for their senior citizens? People are getting screwed again taxpayers. Well, we have some other things we wanted to talk to you about, but uh, we'll probably have to do it next week. And uh, in the meantime, we'll be at the White Horse.